Welcome to the Paid Search Podcast. My name is Chris Schaefer, and I'm here to talk about Google Ads. I hope you have your learning cap on because there is a ton to talk about. You guys have sent me questions, and I am going to answer them. These are always some really fun episodes that I like to do because I have some really smart listeners out there. You guys have some great questions and I'm answering seven questions straight from my inbox. I'm going to go through them one by one. They're from all around the world and I'm going to jump right in. I'm going to tell you that you also can send me a question at paidsearchpodcast.com. You can go there, send the question in. There's an email listed. If you want to just send an email directly, you can go to paidsearchpodcast at gmail.com. That is the direct email you can contact me with. And usually I reply and say, hey, good question. I'm going to answer it on the show. So you know to listen. You won't miss your answer. I try and do that as a courtesy. I appreciate you guys listening. appreciate you guys supporting the show. If you would like to really do me a favor, you can go check out my one and only sponsor that keeps this show on the air because it does take time. There is expenses involved, and you can do me a favor by checking out and doing yourself a favor also by checking out optio.com slash PSP. So many reasons to use this software to get more done in Google Ads. I can guarantee you it offers peace of mind because as you'll hear in one of the questions that we have today, it's about, you know, Chris, how do I how do I even take a break? How do I even breathe with Google Ads when I have clients, when I have demands, when things can always go wrong? Well, this tool is there to alleviate that. It is there to check things, make sure that there are no abrupt changes to the account, giant click spikes, conversions just stopping for some reason, uh, the campaign payment issue stopping the account entirely. These are things that can be massive and very embarrassing if you don't follow up with the client right away when it happens. This tool can help you do that. If you're managing accounts or if you are just a business owner managing your own account, you want to make sure your money is spent right or your client's money is spent right. Optio.com slash PSP. Two month free subscription. Two months. That's twice as long as you get if you just go to Optio.com. But if you go to Optio, that's O-P-T-E-O dot com slash PSP. They have an AI ad writing system. They have alerts. They have a Slack integration. They have Bidding optimization, negative keyword monitoring, budget monitoring, all kinds of things, all the things that you want a tool to do, it does. Okay, so we are going to jump in with the first question. The, I'll tell you what, I'm just a guy from Texas and I don't meet a lot of people that are outside of Texas, honestly, so I have some names. <laughs> I have some names here that I'm going to try and say. I did not cheat and Google how to say these, so I'm going to say them with my Texas tongue, the way that I think they're, they're pronounced. I hope you giggle and laugh, and I hope you're not offended, because I am answering your question for free, so <laughs> you owe me. I'm gonna, I may see your name wrong. All right, so first wrong name, so, so Iteris so, says, writes in and says, should... Target return on ad spend, the abbreviation is T-R-O-A-S, target ROAS is the other name, other way to say it. Should target ROAS be the bidding strategy that all advertisers ideally choose? Even if they start a new campaign and choose a different strategy, is target ROAS the holy grail of them all? When an advertiser creates a new campaign, is there a specific order? we should follow on bidding strategies? And does this process depend on the actual weekly conversions that the account gets? Wonderful question. Starting off strong. I love this question. This is great. So I'm going to lay out my method on how I go through bidding strategies. This follows the Google Ads optimization process. These are the 
four phases of Google Ads, as I've described in previous episodes. I do not have that episode number on hand, but you should be able to find it. It's probably about two or three months back. You can find it. It's about the Google Ads phases, phase one, phase two, phase three, the optimization process of Google Ads, and this follows that process. So my number one is to always choose, personally, for me, manual bidding. Always, 100% of the time. If I'm managing the account, I always choose manual bidding. No other options in my mind. Now, if you are afraid of manual bidding, you don't want to get into it, it's confusing to you, which I tell people, I, I understand that all the time. I do consulting and I have one hour to teach and train and show someone how to manage their account. And sometimes I will build an account and use max clicks just to keep their knowledge curve, learning curve as level as I can. So max clicks is okay. But for me, manual is first. Then after an appropriate amount of time, I'm not going to go into all the details about when that is, but after an appropriate amount of time, usually maybe 30 conversions, 30 to 20 conversions a month, or, you know, a, a, a relatively good strong percentage of conversions coming in, then I will consider max conversions or target cost per conversion, target CPA, target CPA. Then to answer your question, yes, I do consider target ROAS to be the eventual, and I like exactly how you say it, goal, holy grail above all others. I think it is the ideal. It is absolutely the ideal if you are running an e-commerce campaign, a campaign that tracks purchases where you're selling something. If you're selling a product, service, something that you actually have a transactional value that absolutely is the holy grail. And for lead generation, it's also the absolute holy grail because you might know that if you get 10 phone calls, you can close three of them. And usually those phone calls are worth this much. And if you get 10 forms, you can close this many of them. And, the, and typically selling that kind of thing is worth this much. That is a phenomenal place to be as a lead generation person because you know that you might need to push phone calls more or web forms more and you can track the value that's coming in through every one of those so yes it's definitely the holy grail but do not rush it do not think oh i'm gonna i'm just gonna go straight to target roas i'm gonna go straight from manual to target roas that is not the process do not get ahead of yourself do not skip from phase one to phase four that's not how it goes you start at phase one Go to phase two. Phase one is get quality traffic and spend the budget. Phase two is to start to remove unwanted traffic and start getting conversions. You start getting more conversions. You Then you start moving to phase three, which is optimizing and encouraging more of those conversions by cutting out certain areas, devices, time of day, days of the week, entire ad groups, entire keywords to start to optimize heavily on those conversions. And phase four is scaling. Often target ROAS be becomes an option at phase four. And a timeline on that might be a year, two years before you get to that. It might be six months, but don't think this is a week thing. This is not a month thing. This is not a two month thing. Don't rush it. All right. So next we're going to go over to the UK. Jamie from the UK who runs a cross-stitching magazine for men. I'll tell you what. You guys are some creative people out there. I love it. People people ask me, you know, Chris, what do you what do you think about college? What do you think about what do you think about you know, do I need to go to college to start a Google Ads management? agency and all this stuff. And, and I think about all the crazy things out there, all the crazy businesses out there in the world that people come up with a magazine for cross stitching and you know, men that are into cross stitching this. I mean, it's amazing. I love it. Never done it. Don't, don't, don't get me another hobby. I have plenty of hobbies, <laughs> but I love it. I think it's great and to think of all the creativity out there and to think that 
you know, you have to go to college in order to come up with one of these creative things. That's such baloney. Keep it up. That was totally not the topic you're here for, so I apologize. Question from Jamie. Would you ever do a section where you look at future trends just so you could call it the Schaefer things to come? <laughs> That's funny. The answer is no. I would never do that because the moment that you start guessing what Google's going to do, you're in trouble. So, you know, don't do not do that. That's not going to be a, a, a good bet because you never know. No one can ever guess, but that is funny. But you won't catch me, you know, guessing and saying this is what's coming this is what's coming um because i just try and i just i just try and stay afloat much rather uh, than than guessing how the current's flowing all right so here's the real question from jamie i have two campaigns that are largely aiming at the same sort of audience the first is targeted at men who cross stitch with a, su a suitable lead magnet at the end the new campaign, the second campaign, is broadly aimed at terms like cross-stitch magazine, magazine, as I'm directly hoping to outbid my competitors. How can I make sure my new campaign isn't competing with my older one? The new campaigns are really more important. You said it right there. So make sure, Jamie, and those listening. Specifically, Jamie said it's more important. The new campaign is arguably more important, so I wonder if I need to adapt the men who cross-stitch campaign. Okay, so the answer here is in two forms. If you have two campaigns that you've created, first, you should not be creating a separate campaign just because you have a new idea. Okay, new ideas could very well just fit in a new ad group. There's no reason to create a new campaign just because you have a new idea. Very often, the only times you need a new campaign is if you need to do a separate budget, separate geographic targeting. There's something at the campaign level that is critical to this working properly. So let's assume that that's the case. You do have a legitimate reason for having two separate campaigns. You would want to make sure that these are not competing, quote unquote, competing with each other, which is a whole nother thing, uh, to, whether things compete against each other and what that really means. I'm not going to get into it. But the idea here is that you should keep the two campaigns separate either in the intent of those keywords and or through the bids of those campaigns. So let me explain what that means. The intent, the idea behind the keywords for each of these campaigns should be completely separate. So that means for your new campaign, which is targeted at cross-stitch cross magazine, it should be all cross-stitch and it should be something around content cross-stitch blogs forums magazine it should so the whole intent here is people looking for content about cross-stitching this is very exclusively focused on that the other campaign targeted at men who cross-stitch it should not get into content that's the black area of the campaign here that it should never cross it should be completely separate it should be blacked out it should be completely separate from the other one because this other campaign should be targeting everything else you know maybe just the word how to cross stitch or ideas for cross stitching or something like that these are not people looking for necessarily content or communities or, or something like that this is important as well as the differentiation in the bids. If you're using manual bids, which I'm always going to cite because I'm a big manual bid user, the answer is easy. You keep these at separate intervals of bids. The most important campaign might be $2 bids. The least important campaign might be $1 bids. The number is not important. It's the ratio difference. A 50% difference between them makes sure that the competition between them if it does happen is going to be very little because the high intent quality traffic most important campaign has much higher bids therefore higher ad rank it's going to eat up all the traffic that's there and the lower intent less valuable is going to have lo much lower bids and is not going to be able to reach wherever these other keywords are going so those two are separated both by intent and bids i hope that's helpful 
And you should know, I'll add here, another quick jab at automated bids. You say, well, Chris, I'm running target ROAS here, or I'm, I'm running max clicks or target cost per acquisition. How do I make that work? Well, you know what? You can't. It doesn't really work that easily. And it's not guaranteed. That rule does not apply. Therefore, I will always uphold manual as the most precise, advanced way to run campaigns like this and actually get what you want done, to actually make a specific goal and accomplish that in the campaigns. Nothing can do it like manual bidding. Okay, we've got a bunch more. Let's keep going. Got another name here, Holger. Holger from Germany writes in and says, Hey, Chris, cheers from Germany. I discovered your podcast a couple of weeks ago when searching for know-how on Google Shopping Ads. Thanks for the excellent and understandable information you provide, and special thanks for me as a non-native English speaker. Holy cow, speaks more than one language. <laughs> Blows my mind. For your clear pronunciation. Well, thank you. Holger goes on to say, in a recent episode, episode number 374, you talked about the changed definition of match types. How do I set up a shopping campaign in a really efficient, effective way using negative keyword lists? And what's changed in the course of the updated definitions of match types? Okay, so first, and... and I don't know if this is an area that you're confused about or maybe just didn't type it entirely the way that I can understand it. So maybe a misunderstanding here, but I want to I want to clear something up. The definitions of match types have only changed for keywords, not negative keywords. You have to understand that when I say keywords, I mean broad phrase exact of the targeting keywords, the keywords that you actually use to gather search terms, to gather clicks, to gather impressions, traffic. That is what a keyword is. A negative keyword is only that. It is a broad phrase, an exact negative keyword, and it only blocks traffic. It only stops traffic from coming in from those. Those have never changed. And as far as I'm concerned, I mean, to take Schaefer things to come. I mean, there's there's your section right there. I would say, I would go so far as to say that negative key, the definition of a negative keyword will never change. There are specific reasons for that. And I'm betting, I'm betting there's been some very brief conversations in the, the Google universe up at the high level that have considered it and realized, no, that can't happen. No, we cannot change negative keywords. So I don't think it'll ever change. So, Holger, here is the answer for you. Now that you know that negative keywords have not changed. If you want to get a better, more effective, efficient shopping campaign, there are three ways that I would suggest. Number one is use good descriptive titles. Maximize your titles in your product feed as best you can. Use generic and specific terminology. Right? If you're selling something you need to be specific about, the material type, the size, the style, the color, you know, whatever it is that's important that would differentiate your product that might make it valuable for someone who needs that, the wattage, the, the softness, the firmness, whatever you're describing, you need to use that language and be specific as well as generic. You have a lot of characters you can use. The number evades me on how exact number of characters you can use in a title, but it's a lot. It's a lot. Use that. Number two, GTIN numbers, the global trade, blah, 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 the number. That is a, as you've heard Joey Bidner, who's been a guest on the show several times, talk about on the show. That is an important term, an important aspect of your campaign that allows Google to gather information that it would not otherwise know about your product. It uses other products to gather that information and make sure you show up when those other products are showing up that share that same GTIN category. Very important. Okay, so those two things, you're really on your own there. You're just going to have to do the best you can. 
if you want to use negative keywords, this is the rule. You should not overuse negative keywords. You should only use broad match keywords as a single word. So if you're going to block the word leather for some reason, because you don't ever, you don't ever sell anything containing leather, but you know, you have jackets, but no leather jackets. You don't ever want to show up for that. So you block the word leather. You would do that because you saw search terms that contain the word leather and you want to stop those. You don't usually, usually I do not suggest that you preemptively build negative keyword lists based on a hunch or based on a Reddit post that you found that said, Hey, I created this 7,000 negative keyword list for all the lawyers out there who want to block stuff. What a dumb idea. Don't take shortcuts. Don't use those lists. It's a bad idea. If you did your Google ads campaign the right way, you should not need those lists. You know, who's putting those lists out people who don't know how to build campaigns and had to have 7,000 negative keywords because they have crap keywords in their account. So they have to have that many because they don't know what they're doing. If you have well-built campaigns, you can force Google to get you the kind of traffic you want. So you don't need massive keyword lists. Build your keywords based on the need, based on areas that you can see and then exclude. When you see the search terms and you see unqualified traffic coming through, take action. That's what I call the reactive management aspect, where you're looking at search terms, you're looking at the results and reacting to those and making changes in order to optimize. Okay, and I guess I should say, what did change, by the way, just for those of you who may be confused, when I discussed, I guess it was episode 374, about keywords changing, what did change are keywords. Broad match, phrase match, exact match keywords have changed. They changed the definition of keywords. So that's what I was referring to. They did not change the definition of negative keywords. So if you're curious about that, that is a massive thing you absolutely have to understand if you're going to run Google Ads is understand what a keyword is and how it works. Very important. All right. So Andrea from Vienna, Austria, specifically notes the place with no kangaroos. Austria. <laughs> I love that. Very funny because I probably would have just said Australia and been embarrassed. So thank you, Andrea, for not letting me embarrass myself. Andrea says, hello, Chris. I listen to your podcast regularly and find it very helpful resource for getting better at Google ads. Thank you. I have a question about the optimization of search terms. The thing I don't understand are the search terms that we don't see. Can the search terms that are not displayed in Google ads be the same as the ones that are visible? The answer to that is Yes, they can be the same, but they are not necessarily the same. I'm going to get more into that in a minute, but to answer that question, Andrea goes on. I asked this question because I once made an Ingram analysis and excluded all the words that have never, ever brought a conversion. After that, the conversions dropped. Then I undid all of that and the performance was good again. <laughs> yes. For those of you listening, learn from Andrea's mistake. I'm going to describe it in a moment. Learn from her. She, she, she took massive liberties to just see, look at search term data, create an ingram, ingram, so we're referring to, which is, you know, isolating keywords and looking at the, the, in, uh, the number of words that are used across these search terms and, and grabbing the ones that had the most usage and never had any conversions and then blocking those. Bad idea. I'll talk about it more in a second. So Andrea continues lastly here. So I'm not sure if I should exclude all search terms or a part of it with just low conversion performance or how I should optimize search terms at all. Okay. So as I said, search terms you don't see can be anything. Do not assume that the ones that you don't see are just duplicates or they could represent terms that you don't, they could be completely unique terms. We don't know what they are. Don't assume anything about them. You're just going to have to forget about them. They're gone. Many, many episodes ago, my old co-host and I mourned 
yelled, cried, went through all the phases of grief right on the show. And we're over it. Okay, you're just going to have to forget about them. All right. So let's talk about search terms, optimizing search terms. Do not exclude search terms just based on conversions. There is a reason why a search term can still just get traffic without any conversion value over time. The reason for that is because search terms still represent value even if they get zero conversions. And that's because that search term represent a person. It represents a moment. It represents a click and a chance of value for a person to convert. Do not make Google Ads a binary transaction where either you get this traffic or you don't. Either it converts or I cut it out. As Andrea described, you will fail at your job. You will stop getting traffic almost entirely. You will definitely stop getting conversions because there is no binary connection between this keyword converts or th this search term converts and this one doesn't, period, always. No way, not going to happen. Things change. Things are always fluid when it comes to conversions moving and changing. It can happen seasonally. It can happen day by day. It can happen week by week. Do not narrow this down into an engram science. Bad idea. You can make big assumptions over a long period of time and make some risky changes, but you should not do this in bulk. When you do manage or optimize search terms, what you have to do, let's not even take into account the conversions. Let's say you're not even getting conversion data. You don't even look at it. When you're managing search terms, what you should understand is that the search terms should have value associated with them. You should block search terms. You should not get search terms that don't represent the intent or the value of what you originally wanted. This is a big reason why, for example, I very often tell people, do not allow competitor terms to come through on your keywords. Block those search terms. Because you didn't intend to get that competitor. It just came through on that search term. I was working on a, a foot pain doctor recently. And you know what came through? Tons and tons of doctor names. And you know what good that was? Absolutely nothing. It was a waste. I immediately just started going on a frenzy, blocking first names, blocking all these different things because there's no value there because that was not the intent of my keyword. So when you're optimizing search terms, if there's one major thing you keep in mind is, is this what I want to spend my traffic on? Not, did I get a conversion? It's, does this have value? And then the second possible follow-up question would be, did I pay too much for that value? Is this kind of a, it's a valuable search, but uh, it's not really worth $21. I should have paid closer to $2 for this. Then you need to assess and make some adjustments to your campaign, bidding, keywords, all that. You know, there's a lot that you can do there, but that's the idea. Are you paying for the value of a search appropriately? Next, we're going to go over to British Columbia, Canada, to Dan. and says, I love the show. Been listening since around 2016. Holy cow. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate that. I hope you've left reviews. Dan, you better left a review. <laughs> Sorry, Dan. It's helped me replace my old job's full-time wage of supporting my family and jump in as a full-time freelancer. That's awesome. Love it. I'm so glad I was able to help you do that. That is phenomenal. Been full-time since the spring of 2021 and love it. But it does have its downside. And that's what I want to ask you about. As a freelancer, I love the freedom of when, where, when and where I work. But I feel that's impossible to take days off. I don't think I've taken a true day off since starting Google Ads. <laughs> I was wondering if you have any tips on how to take time off. Do you take days off? 
sick days or anything like that? If so, how do you do it and ensure nothing happens to your accounts while you're taking those days off? Okay, Dan. So obviously this is a question not about Google Ads, but more about the management of Google Ads, which I had said I was wanting to do a little bit more of that to help you guys out because I know there's a lot of people that have questions like that. So the answer is yes, I definitely take days off. In fact, I'm taking the next two days off. It's currently Thursday right now. I'll be taking Friday and Monday off because I always schedule at least one day of the month. That's not a family vacation, but just a day that I don't have to do my normal process. And I, I just take kind of a personal day. I mean, you could, you could call it whatever you want, but it's, I, 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 I have to take a little bit of break because as a freelancer, I absolutely, all the weight of what I'm doing is on me and I just need a little breather every now and then. I certainly take weekends off, but that's always high intensity for family and my kids and stuff like that. So you could hardly call it a break. So let's talk about what those look like and how I can get away with that. In truth, even on my days off, not weekends, definitely not Sundays, but on my days off, I'm always checking accounts, even when I'm on vacation. I take my computer. I have a special packing system that I use. I bring my whole desktop. I, I do not work on a laptop. I will not work on a laptop. I have a desktop with a big screen, and I, ha I pack it all into this super nice case, and I bring it all with me, and I always set it up but it only takes me a fraction of the time. I only spend, you know, I get up early in the mornings on my my vacation days when my with my family. Usually the the kids are, you know, eating breakfast or something. I'm quickly just going through stuff and I'm done. I check my accounts, I go through a few things and I make sure everything's okay then I move on. I, so I send I spend a fraction of my time. That's how I'm able to take time off and not make sure that I'm missing something incredibly important, you know, that, that could jeopardize my clients in some way. Very important. So Dan, let me say this to you. I think you're a victim of overmanagement. I know there are times whenever a credit card could stop working or an ad gets disapproved or something like that. But if you are just starting, you've been full-time managing for two years now, there's no way, I mean, I'll be honest, you don't have more accounts than me. I mean, I'm, I'm serious. There's no way. There's no way you have more accounts than me. I manage a lot of accounts, a lot of clients, plus my consulting that I do, plus my podcast and all that. So there's no way that you do. So I think you're over managing. I think you spend too much time in your accounts, tweaking, changing. I mean, do you really need to spend another 30 minutes looking through all the keywords and changing the bids 5%? on this one, 5% up on this one, 5% down on this one. Check just all the, no, you don't. I, d I don't think you need to do that. I know you don't need to do that. Stop it. You can probably relax a bit. Besides that, one little plug here before I get into the last couple questions. Dan, the solution, I think a solution for you is Optio. I actually thought about this. This is not necessarily my my plug, but I'm going to make it my plug. Optio is a good solution for you because it will alert you when there are critical failures on the account, things that you need to pay attention to, things that you would be embarrassed by if you did not reply to the client very quickly. So I think Optio would be a great solution for you. And Dan, if you haven't tried it, shame on you. If you've been listening to the podcast for so many years in case you have somehow forgotten about that URL, it is opteo.com slash PSP. Use the chat box at the very bottom of the screen to ask them for two months free and then apologize, Dan. Apologize for waiting this long. Shame. Shame. All right, best of luck, Dan. Congrats on your, your new job and career. I love it. Jenny says... Hi, Chris. I love the show. I've learned so much from your show and a few coaching sessions that I've done with you. Well, thank you, Jenny. Glad to hear it. Could you speak more about the retargeting options available on Google? What does retargeting look like? Also, 
What's the difference between affinity audiences and in-market audiences? When do I want to use either of these? How should I use them correctly? Good question. Jenny, what you probably didn't realize is you just mixed two separate things together, and I must take a moment to separate those for those listening and for you. Remarketing does not use affinity or in-market audiences. I don't know if you meant to combine those into you know, one thought here, but that is not the same thing. Remarketing uses your custom audience, your own audience, audience that you've gathered from people that have been to your website and you've collected that data. That is a remarketing audience. Retargeting, remarketing, it's all the same thing. So that audience is for you to be able to blast out a message in the best way you feel would serve that audience. I've seen remarketing audiences in the tens of thousands. I've seen remarketing audiences in just the hundreds. It is based on how much traffic that advertiser gets. Use these to try and resell or reinforce a message for brand or for lead generation to regenerate interest on your product, service, brand, whatever it is that you're doing. That's what the remarketing is about. It should look like someone just checking the weather, watching a video, reading something directly on the Gmail app, something like that, where there are ads that are built in. All these different places. They could be reading a blog, reading the news, and your ad, it could be on the New York Times, and your ad pops up on that screen. And... They don't know they're being remarketed to. It's just like any other ad. It looks no difference, different to them, but you have specifically targeted them because they've been to your website recently. That's what remarketing is. That's how it should look. And it should be fairly cheap. And I'll tell you, usually it doesn't generate a whole lot of conversions. Mainly because people don't typically click on the remarketing ad. Now, if you're offering some amazing discount or something like that, you may get a higher click-through rate in a good conversion rate. But most of the time, it's just about impressions. Most of the time, I measure my success of my remarketing based on impressions. How many impressions I got? I mean, I got I got 10,000 impressions and I only spent like 50 bucks. Awesome. Great. Love it. No conversions. Don't care. You only got 15 clicks. Don't care. I got 10,000 impressions and only spent 50 bucks on it. Okay. So that's what remarketing is. Now, affinity and in-market audiences, those are Google's audiences. Those are audiences that are based on, for in the, in the case of affinity, that has to do with interest, hobbies, like cross-stitching, or other hobbies out there, from cars to sports to, to, to anything. There could be a ton of different hobbies that people have, interests over time. This Someone has an affinity for it, an interest, a love for something. They have affinity audiences. In-market audiences, again, are also Googles. Those are people who are looking to buy a new house, buy a new car, possibly doing remodeling on their home, buying a new TV, upgrading their, their phone plan. These are things that Google knows based on the person they're put into this audience and you can show them an ad. This is not remarketing. Served on the same network, it can still serve on Google display, but it's not remarketing. It's served to a different type of audience, a different type of people. It's not your audience. It's an audience that everyone shares, either an affinity or an in-market audience. So don't use affinity and in-market for remarketing. Use your own remarketing audience that you built yourself. Okay, we are going to wrap things up with Chris in Wisconsin. And before I do this, I want to thank you guys so much. If you have been listening to the show for a long time or you just started and you're really appreciating what I do here, I would appreciate it if you left a review, whatever network, whatever platform you are listening on, leave a review. Five stars is preferred. 
say hello. I appreciate that. It helps my podcast to grow. It helps Optio to continue to vet, invest in me, which helps me to invest in you. So it's a complete circle. I appreciate that. It's important to continue to grow the show. And it's the only thing I ask. If you're watching on YouTube, leave a, a like, subscribe, whatever. I appreciate it. Chris in Wisconsin, Wisconsin says, long-time listener, second-time questioner. You and Jason featured my question about attribution models back in 2018, 2019. <laughs> wow. Awesome. I love it. I love it hearing all these from these people who've been around for five, six, seven years. That's amazing. Have you ever covered search partners on the show? Ah, yes, definitely. But I won't fault you for forgetting that. You've listened you've listened to probably hundreds of episodes, so <laughs> yeah, let me go back and start over. I started <laughs> Chris, I started getting on to you. I should stop doing that. I appreciate you guys. Have you ever covered search partners on the show? I've never been a fan of it, but I am working with some colleagues and they say if it's quote unquote performing, then keep on it. Keep it going. However, I've looked at their accounts and I see campaigns where search partners are consuming 75% of the budget. When I look at the search terms report and segment by network, I see those conversions coming in on either irrelevant or highly suspect search terms, which to me confirms search partner is wasted spend, even if it is quote unquote performing. Chris, I have not, I could not have written that better myself. Wonderfully said, and you are, are the smartest out of your friends, which is a pro you might want to get smarter friends. You are absolutely right. Let me explain a bit about search partners. While I have a couple minutes before the show ends, I want to tell you search partners that spend too much is my concern. I am not concerned about search partners overall, just because I'm getting clicks on search partners doesn't mean that's a problem. I don't exclude search partners a hundred percent of the time. I use search partners. It can be a great tool to use. The red flag is search partners exactly as you described. 75% of the budget, 50% of the budget. That is a big issue. 25% is a little bit of a concern there as well because it could start firing up and get more and more. It does, it does go up and down. And I cannot count how many times I have jumped into accounts, auditing an account during a consulting session with someone or my own, you know, management account that I left it on. And I start seeing some weird stuff go, the conversion rate starts to spike. The CPC start to drop. The CTR starts to spike. And I go and look and lo and behold, the search partner network clicks have spiked. And suddenly my metrics look amazing. And it's total crap. It's a lie. It's not true. If I actually were to reach out to the client at that moment, they would probably say, yeah, you know, the past couple of weeks we've been getting a lot of job applications or we've been getting a lot of like people that are outside of our area or people from international locations and all this stuff. And it, it's obviously a bad thing. It makes my numbers look great. But if I manage to my numbers, I'll put everyone out of business that's, that I'm managing. Because it's not about what's on the screen. It's about what the end product is. It's about the conversions, the actual return that's happening for the business. And this, this is massive. This is a huge deal. I believe last week I even talked about the spooky story that I was referencing about a client that was getting clicks for houses in Mexico and stuff like that. I mean, there's, there's, there's a ton of stuff that goes on that you just get these crazy weird clicks. And I've done some investigations and I can say that these search partners are networks that you've never heard of search engines. You've never heard of. I'm not talking about Bing. it's not Bing. it's not things you've heard of. It's weird, weird looking, shady looking search engines that partially hide that it's even an ad if not outright outright hide that it's an ad it's not even labeled that it's sponsored and it puts it right up there at the top it's crazy and these junk conversions make everything look good and if you're not careful 
you can see better and better campaigns, especially if you have automated bidding. It'll lean more into that. Meanwhile, your business, your client, whatever, is seeing decreasing returns more and more. And Chris, as I said, you said it very well. That is exactly the situation I see all the time. Be sure and share Google Ads podcast. This podcast, Paid Search Podcast. Let me get my own podcast name correct. Share Paid Search Podcast with them because they need help. They need help, and I appreciate all of you listeners. Thank you so much. I will be back next week. See you then.